Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast with ESPN NFL host Samantha Ponder is brought to you in part by Compassion International. They do it right. $38 a month allows you to make a difference in a child's life, releasing them from poverty. We're talking about children deserving every single basic necessity that they should have. And through compassion, this is your chance to release a child from poverty through food, education, vocational training, all done in the name of Jesus. Sponsor a child for $38 a month with Compassion International. Here's the website, the URL, compassion.com slash sports spectrum, compassion.com slash sports spectrum. And you make a difference. I want to personally encourage you to do this, to sponsor a child with Compassion. You will never regret $38 a month. Compassion is the most trusted child development ministry in the world. And you can make that difference in a child's life. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Today's guest on the podcast, Samantha Ponder. ESPN NFL host. Of course, you see her on Sunday NFL Countdown on ESPN. She's been with ESPN since 2011, getting her start with the Longhorn Network and then moving over to college football, where she was on the sidelines for college football games and then, of course, worked on college game day, traveling every week to the different cities before switching in 2017 and transitioning, in many ways replacing Chris Berman and working on the NFL with Sunday NFL Countdown, which you can see her every week on ESPN at 10 a.m. Eastern, Sunday NFL Countdown, of course, with Matt Hasselbeck and Rex Ryan and Charles Woodson and Randy Moss and the crew there at ESPN getting you ready for every week in the NFL season. Uh, And Sam, you know, on this podcast, we have kind of a two-parter. The first part we talk about is her job with ESPN now and just balancing that, what that looks like, being the mom to three children, Scout, True, and Price. I love the name of her kids. Uh, Being a wife to Christian Ponder, uh, former NFL quarterback, but just being a mom and a wife and balancing all that with a career in broadcasting. So what's that look like? What does her life look like right now, traveling each week to Connecticut? She lives in New York City uh, during the season, of course. And then just the balancing act of being a mom and being a husband during the NFL season and what that looks like, and then the decision, the difficult decision, I think, to uh, not only from a personal standpoint, but from a business standpoint, moving to the NFL from college game day, where there was such a great, uh, seems like such a great chemistry working in that college atmosphere, but traveling, literally traveling every single week uh, during the season can be very difficult. So we talk about that as well. We also talk about what it was like to grow up having parents who were missionaries and doing inner city ministry work and what that looks like for Sam. So that's part one coming up right now on the podcast. Let's get right to it. Without further ado, Samantha Ponder joins us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Take a listen to part one of our conversation here on Sports Spectrum. Hi, Sam. How are you? I'm doing great, Jason. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining us here on the podcast. And first off, I guess congratulations are in order. We were talking before we started taping this. You have a seven-week-old at home, so congrats on the birth of your third daughter. Uh, Price, I believe, is the name. Third yes. child, I should say, not third daughter. Uh, Price. And we're taping this early in the 18 NFL season here, a couple weeks in, a uh, few weeks back on the job for you. How's it been going being a mom to three and back at work and just life? How's that been going for you? <laughs> oh, it's crazy as usual. But I feel like for us now, this has kind of become a theme because all three of our kids were summer babies right before football season. So with my first, I've, I've had three in the last four years. So with my first, it was right before college game day. And then had my son last summer, uh, but right before my first season on Sunday NFL countdown. And then uh, another one this summer. So it's it's apparently what we do. <laughs> we have babies in the summer and go back to work in the fall. So, I mean, I'd be lying if I told you it's easy. It's certainly a challenge, but it's a good challenge, as you know. Like, it's being a parent is just one of the few things in life where – actually, I, I think there are probably a lot of things like this where the harder you work, the more – 
um, you appreciate what you have. And I think the, the more time we've put in and, and the sleepless nights and all the energy that goes into being a parent, I mean, it's just, it's so worthwhile. So things are good. No, no complaints over here. Was that decision when you left, uh, when you left college game day to go to countdown, you know, certainly a personal and family decision as much as it was a professional decision to just kind of like, all right, I want to be a mom and have a family. And it, it was obviously you kind of documented scouts like, you know, bringing her on the road with you during college game day on social yeah. media and all that. But did that be, just become too much? Yeah. Well, it was funny because the week, it was about a week um, when I first got a call from my agent about the possibility of doing the countdown job, I had just found out I was pregnant with my second and <laughs> traveling, as you can imagine, traveling with one, with my daughter on, you know, she was on over a hundred flights a year, her first life or her first year of life. So, wow. um, yeah, so it was a lot and, but it was all I knew, you know, it was just like, all right, here we go. I, I'm not going to leave her at home four days a week. And Christian was still playing at the time. So he was gone, you know, long days. And so I just took her with me. And then when I found out I was pregnant with my second, I just remember thinking like, well, this is the end. You know, I can't, I can't travel four days a week and do college football, college basketball, and then NBA after that with two little kids with me. Like one, that's, just sounds incredibly difficult. And two, it just wasn't fair to them or to their dad, you know, to just kind of be taking them away. So it's crazy how, I mean, I don't know why I'm always surprised by this, but how God works. Like he obviously knew that. And that same week, um, I got the call about, about doing countdown, which would mean that our family could stay together. We would move up to New York in the fall. And then I'm only gone one day a week, just up to Bristol, as you know. So it's just, you know, two hours away. And um, it's been huge for our family. And I, I think the best thing for me was knowing that once I found out I was pregnant with my second and I was going to have to give up, in my mind, the job that I loved on college game day, that I knew that was still the right thing to do. Even if this job offer didn't come, um, you know, obviously I'm really grateful that it did, but I was ready to say like, all right, this is, you know, this is more important to me to be the kind of mom who's present and keeps our family together. So it worked out great so far. And we added another one since then. So like I said, <laughs> things are crazy. But it's not just a, a job that's convenient, I guess, in the sense of family, because you replaced a legend. Obviously, I worked on that show for many years when I was there. And, you know, replacing Chris Berman, when you get the call for that, are you kind of shaking your head like, what's happening right now? Chris Berman? Yeah. Okay, that's a different <laughs> animal, you know? No, no doubt. I mean, shoot, I probably had the same response that most most fans did when they heard. Like, I was like, uh, come again? Um, because I just didn't, I had never even thought of that position before. And thankfully, there were some people in positions of power and influence in the company that envisioned me there. I think that's one of the great things I'm, I'm learning um, in business is to surround yourself with people who maybe even see more for you than you see for yourself. I mean, I was always kind of a, a dreamer as a kid, but like my, my dreams, relatively speaking, were kind of small, you know, just things that I thought maybe were possible. And it's been amazing to see the people that God's put in my life that were able to kind of open my eyes to, to say, Hey, maybe, maybe you can do even more. Um, and it's been a challenge. Like, gosh, you're right. I mean, I, taking over for someone like him, like I can't really say replacing because it's just, it's not the same, you know, yeah. it's really different. And there are some people that struggle with that because, you know, they want to see what they've always seen. And, and obviously Chris was so um, impactful in not only the NFL, but also just this industry as oh, a yeah. whole, he's on the Mount Rushmore. So, um, so I just had to tell myself from the very beginning, like, no, you're not, you're not like filling those shoes. You don't need to go be Chris Berman. You need to go be yourself. And that's going to bring in probably a little bit of a different audience at times. And that's, that's okay. But yeah, I mean, that whole, that whole transition from being a sideline reporter and doing college game day stuff to like now, Hey, it's on you. And, <laughs> and you're hosting a three hours. The show also moved right after he left from two hours to three hours. So yeah. it's a lot. And I, I don't try and pretend like it's not, but um, I think that's the freeing thing about knowing who you are and, um, and not 
not finding your identity in this is it kind of frees me up to just go in and do my best. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, like, we'll move on to something else. So, um, but yeah, a ton of respect for Chris. He's, he's been great to me and, and super encouraging. So that's been a, a good deal. Share with our listeners just kind of what the, tri- what the um, kind of weekly schedule is like for you. What is, what is it during the season, I guess, in terms of preparation, when you come up to Bristol here, where I still am, and then when you go back down to New York and what you're doing during the week, give us a kind of snapshot. Because you're also still, like I said, a mom and a wife. Yeah. So I, the way it works for me is I'm not good. People always ask like, how do you balance it? I'm like, I don't. I balance to me (laughs) is this like unicorn that I'm never going to find. So I'm all in either way. So during the week, um, other than doing things like this, like a few interviews here and there, I am just like soccer mom central. I take my daughter to school and I'm all in with my kids and, and all that. When they go to bed is when I normally do prep and all that stuff. And I, I will say I found like little ways, like when I uh, take my daughter to school on the way home, I have headphones and I'm listening to, you know, NFL radio or some different podcast. So I'm always like staying up on what's going on during the week. But um, I then on the weekends become total work mom, you know, yeah, and I'm yeah. up in Bristol this year, last year I used to go up at like 5 AM on Sunday morning, right before the show. And this year we just found like, this is a new group that's together. We didn't even really know each other. I knew Matt Hasselbeck from before, but our group as a whole really didn't know each other. So, um, we're spending more time together and I think it's made a huge difference on the show. We meet on Saturday nights for dinner now and, and, you know, just spend that extra time to hang out. I mean, that's what I learned from being on college game day that really really chemistry and your real life relationships are everything like that translates through the TV screen. And it's really hard to have chemistry if you don't really know each other. You know, I would yeah. argue it's impossible. So, um, so that's been a huge help. So I'm up there, uh, in Bristol on Saturday nights and then I come back, I, I watch, uh, most of the first game, the one o'clock game with all the guys, as you know, in the big uh, screening room, in the and, war room, yep. yeah, and then I, <laughs> and then I come home on on Sunday afternoon. We're talking to Sam Ponder here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Your parents do inner city ministry work and have been missionaries for a long time. Tell us about growing up uh, in a lifestyle like that with family and faith, and just what your life was like growing up with parents who were missionaries doing work for the Lord. I, I just didn't know any different, you know? It's, I think a lot of kids feel this way. It's like once you get away from your parents, you finally re- realize like what you had. But I, I grew up with parents. I mean, I've, I've never met anybody in my life who serves and loves the Lord more than my mom and dad. Mm-hmm. Um, and now having been away from that for the last, you know, 12 years or so, I just have such an appreciation, not necessarily for what they were teaching us. They taught us lots of good things, but like my parents are those people who just live it. They don't do a whole lot of talking about stuff and you got to do this and you can't do that. It's mostly just like watching their example. So they started an an inner city ministry with my dad, I think was like 21 or something. They've been doing it for about 40 years now. Um, and he just started showing up at parks in South Phoenix and playing hoop with kids and just asking if he could kind of talk to them for a little bit. I mean, he was that guy that was a little sly with it. Like, Hey, you know, just trying any way to like build relationships. And that turned into a league. It turned into college scholarships. And, uh, now we've moved over. I kind of tried to replicate some of what they were doing in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe. Um, this was started like five years ago. And then my parents went over to Palestine and they're doing it in the Middle East. They built this big uh, facility over there for kids to play. And um, then my dad, while he was over there, became the head coach of the Palestinian national team, which was another <laughs> long, crazy story. And then ended up as the head coach of the national team of uh, the South Sudan. So it's been, God's just been so good and keeps, as he does, opening doors that you never would have seen. I mean, I've seen that in my life, but my parents are such an incredible example of that. As, as long as you say, like, yes, I'm willing, I'll, I'll say yes where you open the doors, he keeps opening them. So it was really amazing to grow up with parents who were so service-oriented and and didn't just tell us 
to do that kind of stuff. Like we saw the sacrifices that they made. Um, and so it's, it's convicting to me as an adult now, especially in the way I raise my kids that at the end of the day, like no matter what I'm saying to them about how important your faith is and, you know, all these things I want to teach them about God, like that really what matters is do they see their mom and dad living it out? Like, do they see our surrender and our sacrifice and our devotion? Like, or is that just like, oh, we read a couple of Bible verses at bed and we say our prayers, you know? So I had such a great example of that, but the struggle then is like, you got no excuse, right? You're, yeah. like, you, you're either going to pass it on and continue that legacy or it stops with you. And so that's a good burden to have, but a burden nonetheless. But even at a young age, those kids are watching like hawks, aren't they? I mean, my daughter's oh my 14 gosh. now, and they watch like hawks on how we react and how we talk and how we live our lives, don't they? Yeah, and I see it with my daughter. My daughter is very precocious and outgoing, and <laughs> she's only four, but already, like, I mean, even this morning, <laughs> taking her to school, sometimes she'll say some things, and I'm like, Scout, that attitude is not okay. And then I immediately hear my own voice. Like I, I hear myself in her and it is so convicting. I mean, somebody asked me the other day, what's the hardest thing about being a parent? And it's just knowing that all of my flaws, all of my sins, no matter what I say to her, like she's going to live out, especially at a young age the things she sees in me. So like, there's no moment where you can be off, you know, like, yeah. and obviously we're going to, but that's why in our house, we do a lot of asking for forgiveness and apologizing and uh, kind of talking through some of our own struggles, because that is, it's a big concern for me. I, I want my kids to see that I mean what I say, that when I say like, God, my life is yours, and then I'm not, like, holding on to things. And when I say, like, we need to be kind and love people because that's how Christ treats us and everything, yeah. that I'm actually kind to people when they cut me off and, and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. So, as you know, it's it's a challenge. It is a challenge. Now, I wonder for you, when you, when you made that decision, that sort of, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life decision in terms of going into broadcasting and media, what, did you wrestle with that based upon the upbringing that you had and what your parents were doing, you know, in terms of going into ministry or was it kind of an easy decision for you to say, this is what I want to do? Well, I wanted to do this since I was in third grade. So that it, it was kind of like implanted in me at a really early age. I mean, my idol was a mod Rashad. Like I would watch <laughs> him do NBA inside stuff. Yeah. And I just thought he was the coolest. He had the coolest job, all this stuff. So I, I knew really early on that I wanted to be in this industry. Um, but I did wrestle with that. Like, wait a second. Am I, can I really serve God and would I really be called to something that would be super positive for me? <laughs> you know, like, can you be called to like, uh, live a, a life of luxury, you know, like to yeah. live a life where people are telling you how great you are. Like that something that created some cognitive dissonance, you know, like there was something in me that was like, wait a second, like how much of this is, I really want to do broadcasting and how much of this is it sure would be great to get some attention and to make a lot of money and all this kind of stuff. You know, so I, I wrestled with that. I would say at a pretty early, like probably starting in, in high school. And then I moved to New York city when I turned 18 to kind of pursue this. And I'll say like in the beginning, I think that kind of went away because I was so driven, as you know, in this industry to, to make it, you know, yeah, to absolutely make connections and like try and I had no connections whatsoever, you know, so I was just like grinding for years to try and um, to get in this position. But I will say over the last, I don't know, I guess seven years since I've been in a position where it's like, all right. I, I've had some version of success. I have wrestled with that. Like, is this really what God could want for me is to, to just like take all the good stuff out of this and make it about me? You know, yeah. <laughs> like it, that's the struggle is like, okay, once you've reached success, like what's all this for, you know? And everybody always says, especially in the church growing up, it's like, oh, you'll have such a great platform. You know, it's that word that everybody uses all the time, your platform. And what I've found <laughs> is like, 
it's really easy to talk about that until you get one. And then you get one and you have a whole lot to lose. And whether it's the fear of financial loss or what are people going to say or is this going to get me in trouble because society's standards have changed in, sort, in terms of what you can say and what you can't say. Um, and it's, it's messy. It's kind of complicated. So, I mean, to answer your question, I feel like I'm still wrestling with that now. That's yeah. like a current thing for me is what do you do with this platform? What do you do when you get what you thought would mean success and it's still not enough and you're still looking for that next thing? So, yeah, I think a lot of that is seeing the way my parents lived. Um, and, and also realizing for myself that like, man, money and any sort of notoriety and success, it's just not enough. It leaves you just as empty as I was when I was grasping for this stuff. So, um, it's a challenge for sure. Well, I have, it's funny you mentioned the word platform because that literally is the next question I have written in my sheet. It says, I want to talk to you about platform and about what that word means. And you kind of discussed it, but I think, you know, it's evolved over the years for you for sure. And I think there's a platform on one level of being on TV and doing, you know, broadcasting. And now it starts to seep in a little bit into your personal life because you marry an NFL quarterback. So that's just going to bring, you know, that platform and the sort of notoriety and the scrutiny and all that comes with it towards you. Tell me about, I guess, that word platform, what it means and how it's evolved. Just even when you were grinding and you were just trying to get a job in this business and, and, uh, and move up into where you are now, but there's still what comes with all that. Yeah. I mean, I've had so many different, different definitions for it over the years. There used to be like a couple things that I really wanted to speak out on and then it just didn't feel right. And I felt like God wasn't opening doors on certain things. And I remember asking a a guy that I have a lot of respect for, uh, in the church recently, I, I asked him like, how do you know when to speak out on stuff? Like when, especially with social media, you know, there's just so many issues that for someone like me, who's always been pretty opinionated, it's hard to not be like, well, here's what I think about this. And here's what I think, you know, just like constantly putting out there what you feel. And he said, look, if you're walking with the Lord, like you'll know, you'll know when it's time. And there have been very few times for me, especially over the last, I'd say six or seven years, where I found what he said to be true, where I just knew like, all right, this is the time to say something. And and what I've kind of used for myself is, all right, what's the real benefit here? Is it a benefit for me? Is it to like try and make me look good or smart or have a good argument or be right? I mean, I also grew up the daughter of an attorney, so I'm, I'm used to <laughs> arguing and everybody, you know, make their point. And it was all about being right and truth. And And what I found is obviously truth is ultimately important, but truth without love is usually just about me being right. You know, it's not about like connecting with people and actually doing the ultimate goal, which is to change hearts and for people to, to connect and be in right relationships. So I've had to check my ego so many, I mean, it feels like a, I I understand what Paul was saying when he said he had to die daily. Cause it's like, man, didn't I learn this already? Like, (laughs) why am I putting this comment out there? Even if I'm right on something, you know, something I feel strongly about whatever sort of social issue it is. Like if the ultimate goal is just to prove myself to be right and have people think like, Oh, how, how holy is she? (laughs) You know, that sort of thing. Then no, like, let's just stay away from all that. So I've made a really conscious decision probably in the last three, two or three years to just stay off that stuff. Like I use Instagram as I would say more to use the platform word to show like, this is just how my family lives. This is what life generally speaking looks like for us outside of work. But Twitter is what would get me in trouble because that's where I wanted to like give all my opinions. And I finally got to the place where I was like, just let it go. Like, yeah. let it go. It's got to be about relationships, not about proving yourself right. So I, I certainly, Jason, don't have it all <laughs> figured out on the platform right. um, sense, but I, it's something I'm working on for sure. And we do thank Samantha Ponder for being our guest here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. That was part one of our conversation. We'll have part two coming tomorrow. So make sure you subscribe and download this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Apple, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. Make sure you subscribe and download this podcast and you won't miss part two of our conversation with Samantha Ponder from ESPN. Of course, you can watch Sam every Sunday morning on Sunday NFL 
countdown, 10 a.m. Eastern on ESPN. Get you ready for the day's games in the NFL. And listen, tomorrow when we release part two of our conversation with Sam, we're going to talk a lot about just loving people and what that looks like and in the battle of platform and struggle with um, just being a believer and being that example to others and loving others. And in the Bob Goff book, everybody always is, is brought up. I love Bob. He's the author of that book and the other book, Love Does, that he wrote. And uh, Bob and Samantha and, Samantha and I, I should say Samantha and I, both have a mutual uh, love, I guess, for Bob Goff's books. And we talk about his book and what it looks like to love everybody always. That is a difficult thing for human beings to do. Uh, especially difficult as a believer in Christ when we're called to love everybody always and yet the world gets in the way and people just kind of annoy us and it becomes hard. Um, so we have that conversation. I also ask Sam, because I, I had to, to tell the story of how she met her husband, Christian Ponder, and got married uh, in a very unusual way, I guess, back in December of 2012. That's a fun story uh, to hear. And we also talked to Sam about what she's learning from the Lord in this season of life and her life verse, if you will, her Bible verse. It's really kind of speaking to her uh, right now in this season of life. So stay tuned for part two tomorrow on the Sports Spectrum podcast. We thank you for listening. We also thank our sponsors, Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. That's the website. The sponsor is Compassion International. And we thank Compassion for joining us here and for being a, a, a partner, a sponsor on the podcast. Compassion is just doing great work releasing children from poverty. And what's more, what's more powerful than poverty? It's you making that difference and giving children the basic needs for life. And this is how you can do it. Sponsoring a child at Compassion. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and your $38 per month Sponsor is a child, gives them education and tutoring, medical care and food that they need, vocational training, certainly as they get older, and the opportunity to do all this with them having a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. And Compassion.com does it right. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. That's the URL. That's the website. Go there. And listen, they're releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. Over 1.8 million children so far have been released from poverty through the great work being done at Compassion International. Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Check out the website and sponsor a child today. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the podcast. You can reach us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can take a screenshot of this podcast. Let everybody know in your circle of influence about this podcast, about Samantha Ponder and her journey, and about the stories that connect sports and faith, which is what we're about here at Sports Spectrum. Also, check out our website, sportspectrum.com. Articles, daily devotionals every day, all telling the story of Jesus Christ through the world of sports, the intersection of sports and faith. Thanks so much for listening. Listen to part two tomorrow morning with Samantha Ponder, and we'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast.